Okay, perfect. So welcome everyone to this week's edition of Paleo Perks. Uh, we're really excited to have Joe Moisiek uh, from the University of Toronto and Royal Ontario Museum in Canada, who's going to talk to us about, uh, uh, or give his talk entitled, From Weird Wonders to Spaceships, How New British Shale Discoveries Are Illuminating the Origin of Arthropods, uh, which I think is fair to say is one of the most exciting talk titles I've seen in a while. So very excited. To, um, but before we get to Joe, I just want to um, uh, give you a quick sort of layout of what we're expecting for today's seminar. So we'll have a few minutes of welcome and announcements, uh, which you're listening to now. Um, then Joe will talk for about 30 minutes and we'll uh, follow that up with a moderated question and answer period um, in which you can send your questions um, as soon as you have them or during the question and answer period via the chat uh, to the questions at Paleo Perks host, um, who today is Pedro. And then after the question and answer, we'll have um, an after talk uh, tea time uh, that Joe's agreed to stick around uh, for for a little while afterwards. Uh, so uh, some more housekeeping things. Paleo Perks values the participation of everyone interested in paleo sciences. Uh, so please remember to abide by uh, the code of conduct that you agreed to when you signed up. If you uh, have found yourself here without um, officially signing up and agreeing to the code of conduct, um, you can check it out on our website um, and also sign up so you get the emails for future talks as well. Uh, you should be muted and uh, please, if you find yourself un uh, able to unmute yourself um, while uh, we're doing the official talk time, uh, just don't, <laughs> you can unmute during tea time. Um, and chat a little bit more informally. Um, again, you should ask, uh, send questions uh, via the Zoom chat uh, to the questions um, at Pelia Perks host, um, where is, uh, that's also where you should send any technical issues uh, that you have uh, with Zoom or something like that. Um, so we now have closed captions built into Zoom. Um, I have the, Google captions on as well right now. Um, but once we get to Joe's talk, you um, will be able to see captions if you use the CC button in your Zoom controls um, to show or hide the subtitles. Um, other reminders, please uh, nominate um, any outstanding early career researchers on our website. Um, we're always looking for uh, new nominations, um, including self nominations. So um, if you, you know, just finished a paper or you've got something exciting to present, please nominate yourself as well. Um, we always uh, look forward to that. Uh, so we'll also drop in our weekly feedback form, the link for our weekly feedback form, uh, where we just sort of uh, get an idea of who's attending the talks. Um, it's anonymous and optional, but encouraged. Um, and again, that should uh, show up in the chat window um, sometime soon. So again, today's speaker is Joe Moisiek, uh, who uh, has been at the University of uh, Toronto and the Royal Ontario Museum, uh, did a bachelor's there, and is currently um, a PhD student. Um, and uh, yeah, his Twitter handle is there as well. He included that in his bio. So um, uh, lots of fun arthropods, I expect. Um, but yeah, uh, take it away, Joe, if you want to take the screen share. OK, sounds good. Yeah. So thanks, Chrissy, for that fantastic introduction. Hopefully you can all see my slides now. Yep. Uh, so today I'm going to be chatting with you about some very bizarre fossil discoveries that we've made in recent years at the Burgess Shale and how these discoveries are helping us to understand the origin of arthropods. So in my lab, in Jean-Bernard Caron's lab at the ROM, we're very interested in this phenomenon in Earth's history called the Cambrian Explosion. So this is an event that happened a little over 500 million years ago, and it essentially precipitated the origin of all of the major animal body plans or animal phyla that we still have with us today. So we appear to have this very rapid appearance of all of these different and varied animal groups in the fossil record. But I should also note that this isn't just a phenomenon of the fossil record, and there's also pretty good evidence from studying the genomes of modern animals that there was something interesting going on in terms of evolution 
during the Ediacaran to Cambrian period transitions. And so, of course, I'm really interested in uh, trying to, to figure out what was going on back then. And one of the best groups to study in, in trying to do this, and the group that, that I've focused my PhD on, are the arthropods. And so these include all of the animals today that have a segmented body and jointed limbs. They're incredibly diverse, uh, but basically by any metric that you wanted to use to measure diversity. Uh, and that's also true when we look at the Cambrian fossil record. So these guys have been dominant for a very long time. And then in addition to being very diverse, arthropods also have a lot of uh, really complex morphologies, which are very helpful for us as paleontologists because we have lots of morphological data to work with, whether it's for uh, building phylogenies or for trying to figure out what sort of uh, ecological modes these organisms might have uh, been, been engaged in. And so one of the questions I'm really interested in is how did the arthropod body plan evolve? So if we look at the modern closest relatives of arthropods, the onycophorans on the left here and the tardigrades on the right, we can see that these organisms are quite different from the modern arthropods. They don't really have a segmented body in the same sense as the true arthropods. They don't have jointed limbs. Now, onycophorans and tardigrades can tell us a lot of really interesting information about uh, how they and the arthropods evolved. But we also have to bear in mind the fact that these are both very derived groups. So onycophorans are exclusively terrestrial today, although we think they had marine ancestry. And tardigrades are all uh, microscopic forms. And so, uh, of course, we have to be cautious about trying to infer ancestral states based on these, these very derived modern organisms. And so one uh, alternative to this is to take a look at the fossil record, which is what I'm doing. Uh, and the fossil record of arthropods, as I mentioned, is really great in the Cambrian. And we've gotten a lot of interesting insight about early arthropod evolution, often from some unexpected places. So the fossils that I'm showing on the left here are all uh, things that were in originally interpreted to be various different organisms the back end of a shrimp, a jellyfish, and a sea cucumber. But in the 1980s, Harry Whittington and Derek Briggs discovered that all of these different parts actually came together in a sort of a jigsaw puzzle to form this one bizarre animal, which they called Anomalocaris. And so the re their reconstruction is on the right here. You can see it's a very bizarre animal. It has a pair of jointed limbs at the front, this disc-shaped pineapple slice shaped mouth lined with teeth, and then these sets of lateral swimming flaps along the side of the body. And so perhaps it's not a surprise that Whittington and Briggs were sort of loath to assign Anomalocaris to the arthropods, uh, even though it does have those arthropod-like jointed limbs, because it's just so bizarre looking. And this was also the perspective that was taken by Stephen J. Gould in his famous book, Wonderful Life, uh, so Gould called Anomalocaris and some of the other strange Cambrian organisms weird wonders. So these forms that sort of defied classification into any of the modern animal phyla and might represent uh, their own unknown phyla. So nowadays we have a slightly different view of things. A lot more fossils have been discovered that have helped to fill in the picture of early arthropod evolution. And indeed we do think that Anomalocaris is a relative of arthropods, and more specifically that it's a stem group arthropod. So that is, it's more closely related to the true arthropods than the velvet worms, the onycophorans, or the uh, tardigrades are. But there's one little fly in the ointment here. So Anomalocaris is just one of many, many different early arthropod groups which have been discovered in the fossil record. And they have this incredible degree of morphological diversity. So we have all of these strange um, lobopodian forms on the left, and uh, then things like Anomalocaris on the right. And so how do we actually infer how the arthropod body plan evolved from amongst this menagerie of different forms? Uh, of course, a lot of these different forms have uh, their own complex 
ecologies and they've diversified in, in, uh, in you know, various ways. So the, the question has become a little bit more complicated in that respect. So the group that I focus on to try and understand arthropod evolution is this one on the right, which are called the radiodonta. So they include animals like Anomalocaris and also these other forms which uh, span from the Cambrian to the Devonian period. And these guys are all characterized by this uh, radial jaw, which is where the name of the group comes from. So these are actually the most diverse group of stem group arthropods. And as such, they're kind of an ideal group for, for understanding uh, early arthropod evolution. And so the fossils that I work with come from one particular site called the Burgess Shale, which is world famous uh, because it preserves these exceptional remains of various different organisms from the Cambrian. So right now the Burgess Shale is situated high up in the mountains of British Columbia in Canada. And you can see the exceptional level of quality and detail that we can get from some of these fossils. So when I say exceptional preservation, I mean that things uh, other than just shells and plates and spines can be preserved from these animals. We can get things like their digestive systems, their nervous systems, and even sometimes their last meals still preserved inside them. And so these fossils give us this incredible insight into what was actually going on in the Cambrian and into the anatomy of these extinct organisms. And on the right here, you can see a classic reconstruction of what the Burgess Shale uh, community looks like in, in the top right versus what it would look like if we only had the hard parts of organisms being preserved. So you can just see how much of a wealth of information uh, sites like the Burgess Shale provide us on what was going on in the Cambrian. So the Burgess Shale itself is, like I said, located in BC, just near the border with Alberta. Uh, and the classic site, the Walcott Quarry, has been known to science for over 100 years and has been heavily studied by various different groups. Uh, here's where the Burgess Shale was located back in the Cambrian, so quite a different environment from its high mountain peak of today. It was uh, in fact located at the margin of uh, a broad continental shelf that was near the equator. And so we're talking about an environment that might have been something like the modern day Caribbean. And so we have this large carbonate platform extending out into the ocean and mud slid off the platform and buried various organisms at the bottom, which we think is in part what's responsible for that exceptional preservation. And we can actually see this carbonate platform, the cathedral escarpment outcropping right uh, at the Walcott Quarry. And what's kind of cool about the cathedral escarpment is that you can actually trace its path through the mountains. So this red line in the map on the lower right here is representing the, the trace of the cathedral escarpment. And the really exciting thing about this is that uh, my supervisor and colleagues have been doing some exploration to the south of the Walcott Quarry over the last couple of decades. And they have discovered new Burgess Shale sites about 40 kilometers to the south in Kootenay National Park. And these sites rather remarkably differ in a lot of ways, uh, including having many different elements of the fauna from the original Walcott Quarry. And so the sites in Kootenay are giving us uh, incredible and unique insight into how the Burgess Shale communities varied over time and uh, across spatial scales. And so I'm gonna take you on a quick walk to our Burgess Shale research site before coming back to some of the fossils that we discovered. So firstly, some of these sites that we travel to are very remote, and so we have to access them by helicopter. Often we'll actually stay there for six to eight weeks at a time with a crew of 10 people. And so you can see we need a lot of supplies for that. So we lift the supplies up to our camps using the uh, nets under the helicopter. And here's just a view of what some of our campsites have looked like. So this was a large camp that we made at the Marble Canyon site in 2014. Our cook tent is in the middle here, the, the large white one with the green roof. Uh, now, sometimes when we wanna do some exploration at these sites, we take a smaller group 
and create these little fly camps that are sometimes perched in these very precarious locations, like in this case, in the bottom of an avalanche chute. And just to give you an idea of the scale of this location, here's the same campsite when viewed from a little further away. So it's an absolutely beautiful place to do work. And uh, we're hoping to get back there next summer for some more. So this is what our quarry site looked like at Marble Canyon. The first step was when we got to the outcrop was to try and uncover as much of the shale as we could. So that took a lot of digging from our crew and a little bit of rock tumbling as well. And then once we actually get to the shale, we can finally start using power tools and hand tools to try and crack that shale down into as fine a layers as possible. And it's very important to do a thorough job of this because at some sites, like the Marble Canyon site, in the richest beds, you might have a little chunk of rock that was maybe like 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, and it could contain a dozen fossils. So the richness of some of these beds is absolutely astounding. Oh, and then this was just a, a picture that I thought was fun. This was our hazing for some of the, uh, the, the new recruits for our team. We use a lot of water to try and cool the blades of our rock saws. And so their first task when they got arrived was to collect as much ice as they could and then haul it over these talus slopes to the quarry. I think they were a little surprised by their first day on the job. <laughs> so when, when all is said and done, we pack up all of our gear and our fossils in the nets again, uh, haul them back down to the staging area, and then ship them back to the ROM in Toronto, where we can actually start to study these things in earnest. And it's when we get back to the ROM that we start to understand truly the importance of what we've discovered because these fossils are very difficult to see in the field and you need the right sort of lighting conditions that we can get in the lab to, to really uh, see what's going on with them. But the results can be beautiful like you see here. So I'm gonna introduce now a couple of the radiodont fossils that we've found at some of these new sites and then talk a little bit about what we've discovered about them. So I'm gonna start with this animal, my favorite, called Cambro raster falcatus, or as it was affectionately nicknamed in the field, the spaceship. Uh, and we called it this because we thought it looked a little bit like the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. So this was first published in 2019. Um, it's a really amazing animal. We have slabs that are covered by literally dozens of these carapaces. And when we first started discovering the carapaces, we weren't really sure uh, what to make of them. Uh, but as, as time wore on and we found more and more specimens, we started to find uh, additional parts associated with these strange carapaces, like these jointed appendages on the right and various other head plates. So here's a view of uh, some of those different plates. So again, we have these, this sort of horseshoe shaped carapace with notches at the back. And then we have these more lenticular carapaces with this neck structure at the front. Uh, just a little zoom in on the appendages here. So these things are, are very stout and they have these really long, interesting comb-like outgrowths coming from the, the inside with these forward projecting spines that are hooked like fish hooks. Uh, really odd morphology. And I'll talk a little bit about how we think this thing was feeding in a moment. But you can also see when we look at this uh, second specimen in the middle here that uh, th these inner outgrowths actually curved inwards sort of towards the mouth forming this basket of spines. And so here's an example on the upper left here of what that actually looks like with the, the two appendages preserved along with the mouth parts. Uh, and you can see the details of the mouth parts here in the lower left in particular. So this is the classic radiodont type mouth with a ring of tooth plates. Uh, and in the case of Cambro raster, we also have these additional rows of tooth plates lining the inside of the mouth, making it look pretty ferocious. So at this point, we knew we were dealing with a radiodont. But uh, when we discovered complete specimens of this animal, it was much more bizarre than we could have imagined. So this is one of the best ones that we have. And you can see in the image on the right here, there are these two reflective patches near the midline. And these are actually the eyes of the animal. And so they would have been projecting through those notches at the rear margin of the spaceship carapace. 
And so what's really striking about this animal is that its head takes up more than half of its total body length. And then the whole uh, trunk is just this short little section at the bottom here that's surrounded by a series of swimming flaps. So this thing is basically just a big swimming head. And so here's what we think it actually would have looked like in life. Cambro raster is actually one of the largest animals that we've found at these Marble Canyon sites. Uh, and so it would have been an important predator in that ecosystem. Okay, so Cambro raster was not the only new radiodont that we found in the, these new sites in Kootenai. There's also this animal, which we nicknamed the mothership, which seems to be a close relative of Cambro raster, but is actually quite a bit larger than it. Uh, and we think it's a new genus, but this one is currently in a manuscript in review. So stay tuned for a little more on it very soon. And then finally, I wanted to introduce this animal called Stanley Caris herpex, which we just redescribed in a paper that came out a couple of weeks ago. So this animal is pretty neat. It's known only from its appendages and mouth parts so far. Uh, but you can see that the appendages have some similarities with Cambro raster. We have these sort of rake-like outgrowths coming from the inner margin. And then we also have these weird trident-like medial spines, which you see in the image on the left, as well as a third set of spines, which are these hooked outer spines that you see in the image on the right, uh, looking at, at different specimens preserved at different orientations was of course very important for trying to reconstruct this appendage in three dimensions because it's so complex and it's really just armed to the teeth with all of these spines. Here's a few more images of Stanley Karras, a really nice example on the left here with a pair of appendages that are preserved in a kind of unusual orientation. And then the mouth parts also preserved in kind of a frontal view so you can really see those teeth nicely. And again, the mouth parts give away that this animal is indeed a radiodont. Uh, they consist of this pineapple slice shaped circlet of tooth plates. Uh, in this case, though, there's no rows of inner plates. So that's a difference from Cambro raster. And so here's how we reconstruct what we know of Stanley Harris so far. Okay, so what can we actually learn from some of these new fossils? So first I'm gonna start by talking about how we think these animals are feeding. Oops. Uh, so there's a, a huge diversity of different radiodont appendages that we find at the Burgess Shale and at other sites. And fortunately for us, we can gain a lot of insight about how these extinct organisms were potentially feeding by comparing them with uh, various modern arthropods arthropod appendages tend to be very nicely correlated uh, in morphology with the sort of things that they're feeding on. And so some of my colleagues have done some really nice work with some of the taxa on the right here, comparing these raptorial appendages to those that we see in some modern uh, chelicerates or spider relatives. Uh, similarly, these kind of claw-like forms at the bottom here also look a lot like uh, things that we see in some chelicerates. And then the middle example here is a radiodont that has these very uh, fine CT on its uh, inner spines. And this resembles things like modern krill, which use their appendages for filter feeding on tiny organisms. So already it looks like we've got a lot of ecological diversity among these radiodonts, some forms feeding on large and active prey and others filter feeding. Now, what about the species that we just talked about uh, the, like uh, Stanley Harris and Cambro raster that I show on the left. So these guys are a little more difficult. They don't have as uh, easy and modern analog as some of the, the other forms that I just discussed. But from combing through the literature, I did find a few examples of arthropods that have these interesting comb or rake-like appendages. So this is found among some modern and fossil decapod crustaceans and also in some extinct eurypterids. And in all of these forms, the idea is that they use these appendages for sort of raking through the mud and getting at soft uh, in funnel prey items. And so we think that animals like Cambro raster were probably specialists in doing just the same 
feeding on these in faunal worms and other organisms that they could find. And this interpretation is also uh, cohesive with the interpretation of the, the, the body shape of these animals, which seems to be strikingly convergent with things like modern horseshoe crabs, and also a, to a lesser extent, some of these forms that I show at the bottom here. So all of these guys are united by these very broad and large heads and relatively reduced bodies. And this seems to be a characteristic of bottom dwelling organisms. And so we think that Cambro raster was probably a nectobenthic animal that was feeding on various organisms living in the mud. And now Stanley Harris is an interesting uh, contrast with this because it also has these rake-like inner outgrowths, but in addition, it has these weird dorsal spines. And when we look at modern arthropods, this really resembles the jaw-like uh, edges of the mandibles in some crustaceans, like the, this copepod that I show on the right here. And so we think that these things, that, that uh, Stanley Karras and some of its relatives were using these medial spines to crush prey along the midline. And it's another example of evolutionary convergence with later arthropods. And so these radiodonts were really exploiting a lot of the niches that, that true arthropods came to exploit later. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the body plan evolution of radiodonts now. This is sort of getting back to what I was talking about at the beginning. So generally speaking, we can divide radiodonts into these um, two morphological groups, which I'll call the herdiids and the non-herdiids. So the herdiids have these really enlarged heads with posteriorly displaced eyes, these rake-like appendages, and a relatively short body. The non-herdiids tend to have these really long appendages, these long streamlined bodies, and eyes positioned at the anterior. So how did these two groups become so differentiated? And what might, be able, what might we be able to tell about the radiodont ancestor? This is very important for trying to reconstruct uh, the sequence of character evolution along the arthropod stem group. So this is our latest phylogeny from the paper that we just published on Stanley Karras. Uh, and I'll just go over a few things that we can tell from this. So the non-herdiids appear to be potentially paraphyletic. The herdiids are strongly supported as a monophyletic group. Uh, and among the uh, herdiids, we have some forms like Cambro raster that have these very stout appendages, but other forms like Stanley Karras, which are more basal, have these much more elongated appendages, which are much more reminiscent of what we see in the non herdiids So it's probably a safe bet that the ancestral radiodon had relatively long appendages, probably with 13 segments. Now looking a little bit more broadly at the head morphology of these guys, again, we see that there are some herdiids like Cambroraster that have this really bizarre head morphology. Uh, we don't know as much about the, the head morphology in the basal herdiids as we do about the appendage morphology, but there is one form called Chinderhanas, which seems to show some transitional morphologies between what we see in the non-herdiids that have this relatively short head and the very long heads that we see in the herdiids. Uh, and so, so it looks like the ancestral radiodon probably had a fairly short head and that this condition that we see in animals like Cambro raster is probably derived and potentially an adaptation for uh, bottom welling. Okay, what about uh, ontogeny? So we don't know a whole lot about how radiodonts were developing so far. There was a, a nice paper by Liu et al. that came out a few years ago, publishing a fairly small radiodont that you see on the far left here. Now, but this small individual already looks quite a bit like the adult of the same species. Uh, and so it doesn't seem like there's much morphological change that's going on uh, throughout this later part of development. However, this one juvenile specimen is already about two centimeters long. And so it's, it's, uh, it's possible that there were morphological changes that were happening earlier in the development of radiodonts. Uh, and for example, this might be suggested by the fact that we find 
uh, larvae in these megachiron arthropods that I'm showing on the right here, which uh, have a lot of morphological similarities with radiodons and, and maybe fairly closely related to them. So it'd be very interesting to learn more about the ontogeny of radiodonts. And we have a little bit of work in prep on this. Again, this is a manuscript in review. Uh, and uh, so what you can see here is that we've uh, done some geometric morphometrics and come up with a, a model for the allometric trajectory in Cambro raster. And you can see that as Cambro raster grows larger, the posterior end of the carapace seems to sort of um, expand. And what I think is kind of neat about this is that if we extrapolate a little bit from this allometric model, we actually come up with this very uh, posteriorly expanded shape, which resembles another radiodont carapace that we know of from China. So there may well be some heterochrony that's going on in the evolution of these uh, radiodont carapace shapes. And hopefully, uh, as, as more fossils are discovered, we'll be able to tell a little bit more about this. And then finally, I wanted to talk a little about what we know about the distribution of these radiodonts. So since we described Cambro raster in 2019, there have been a couple of papers that have described new material from North and South China, uh, which obviously belong to the same genus at the very least. Uh, and so it looks like Cambro raster is pretty widespread in terms of its distribution in, in space. And the Chinese sites are also a fair bit older than the Burgess shale. And so Cambro raster also spans a decent amount of uh, time in the Cambrian as well. So it looks like uh, uh, these radiodonts were sort of cosmopolitan organisms living in various different environments. Uh, this is a, a similar example for Stanley Karras. So far its distribution is a little bit more localized than for Cambro raster. We only find it in uh, the uh, craton that will become North America so far. And so just to finish up, radiodonta is really, um, through all of these new discoveries, turning from these sort of weird enigmatic animals that are hard to understand into a model clade for understanding the origin of arthropods. We really understand more about radiodonts than pretty much any other arthropod stem group. I even heard one uh, Twitter user quip that radiodonts are becoming the new trilobites in terms of their, their diversity and their potential for telling us about macroevolutionary patterns. Uh, and I should know that we have a lot of cool discoveries that are gonna be coming out pretty soon. So our knowledge is just gonna continue to expand. And so it's a very exciting time to be working on this group. And then I just wanted to finish off by saying that uh, it's kind of fun to work on radiodonts as well because they're pretty popular as invertebrates go. And so when we published Cambro raster, I was really uh, surprised and elated to see many artists getting inspired by Cambro raster and making all kinds of super creative uh, different artworks and you know 2D and 3D models and and uh, even Yu-Gi-Oh cards. So this has been a lot of fun to, to, to work on this stuff. And then finally I wanted to finish off just by giving a little plug for the Wilner Madge Gallery of the Dawn of Life which will be opening up at the ROM this fall. Uh, and it will showcase a lot of these radiodonts that I've talked about, as well as many of the other cool Cambrian fossils from the Burgess Shale. And so I really hope that some of you will be able to come and visit us this fall and see the new gallery. And with that, there are many people that I would like to thank. Uh, and of course, I'd like to thank everyone here for, for the invitation to speak, and uh, I hope you enjoyed. Thanks a lot. Yeah. All right, thanks. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and we already have uh, some questions coming in. Awesome. Um, so let me get back to those. Um, so uh, Morrison Nolan has sent uh, three questions. Um, I'll do them uh, one at a time um, in case other people send in things as well. Um, but here's the first one. So it says the Burgess shale matrix seems to have many colors. Is this a lighting difference or a matrix difference? Right. Yeah, it's true. Uh, and this is um, 
I guess in part a little bit of, of everything, but um, there's differences in terms of the matrix coloration between some of the different sites. So at some of the sites in Kootenai, for example, the matrix is much lighter colored relative to what we saw at the Walcott Quarry, some of the traditional localities that are further north. Um, and then there's also differences that occur because of weathering of the matrix. So a lot of times the matrix will start out as sort of a darker blackish or gray color, but if it's left out in the elements in the talus slopes, it will often turn to a sort of orangey yellow color. Uh, let's see, so I'll put the next one in the chat as well. Um, this one says, do radiodonts have a conserved number of swimming flaps, like how insects have six legs, arachnids eight legs, etc.? No, they do not. And uh, although in, um, many of the herdiids seem to have a fairly conserved number, at least at the level of preservation that, that, um, that we can, can tell from, some of these things are not necessarily well preserved enough to get a really uh, a definitive count of the number of flaps. Uh, but when we look at some of the non herdiids there's quite a bit of variation in the number of, of flaps. That's interesting. Um, and then question uh, number three, uh, did radiodonts uh, ectice like later arthropods and are the isolated mouth parts, arms, tails uh, generally thought to be molts? Yeah, great question. And so, uh, a couple of the specimens that I showed earlier have the appendages preserved and sort of both appendages together alongside the mouth parts. And then in some of the Cambro raster specimens, we also see uh, examples of the, the carapace and then both claws sort of dissociated behind the carapace. Um, we see that sort of pattern over and over again. And so my hypothesis is that many of these probably do represent molts of the animal where there's a very stereotyped um, orientation that the different parts end up in after they've molted. We don't know completely for sure, but I think it would make a lot of sense, especially when we start looking at some of these assemblages of Cambro raster where there's like dozens of these elements covering surfaces. I think we may be dealing with mass molting events. Thanks. Um, and then sort of on the same a uh, line of uh, molting and growing and whatnot. Um, another question says, you mentioned that Camberaster was one of the larger fossils you found at your site. What's the overall size range that you see? Uh, so the, the biggest carapaces that we have could get up to about 20 centimeters long. And so we estimate that the whole animal would have been more than a, a foot long. And that's huge compared to a lot of the Burgess shale animals, which are closer to the size of like a fingernail or something. Uh, but some of the smallest Cambro raster individuals get down to more like, uh, like almost five centimeters long. Oh, wow. So we have a decent range in size, uh, although we're missing the very young juveniles, unfortunately. It's One more reason to go back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, I think I see one more that I will go ahead and copy in. All right, so this one says, this is such a neat example of an adapted radiation of this group into a huge range of ecological niches and reminds me a lot of the fish radiations today, uh, like in like uh, Victoria cichlids. Do you have a sense of what uh, ecotypes or niches might be missing that you would expect to find at some point? What do you think those radiodonts would look like? Ooh, good one. Let me see. That is a good one. <laughs> well, I think, um, one of the things that we, we uh, predicted in our, our paper on Cambro raster was that the, uh, basal herdiids would probably have a fairly short head compared to some of the forms like Cambro raster. And so we definitely expect to see, uh, in Cambrian deposits, um, some examples of herdiids with short heads that might be sort of bridging that, that gap between these uh, really specialized, mostly benthic forms that, that make up most of herdiid diversity and the more streamlined 
examples of radions like Anomalic Harris, which are probably feeding on more mobile prey. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, otherwise we have suspension feeders, we have sort of uh, fast moving active predators, we have sediment sifters that are feeding on a whole variety of uh, different sized prey in the, the sediment. Um, I think it's hard to it's hard, hard for me to predict what else might be out there, but yeah, there's so many weird things already that who would have guessed. <laughs> uh, all right, we've had another question um, sneak in uh, from uh, Roy Plotnik that asks, do you have evidence for how the mouth parts moved, um, opened or closed or shifted pieces or any of that? Yeah, that's something that's still um, a bit hard to assess. Mostly we have disarticulated mouth parts. And so any movement or shifting of the plates could always be due to just partial disarticulation after death. A lot of times when we see the mouth parts in the articulated specimens, they're not all that visible or well preserved. I think so. I, I think that's something that um, um, still needs to be worked out in some level. And I think potentially, I guess, some uh, biomechanical studies might be really useful and interesting for getting at that. Yeah. All right. I think that is all that I see for now. Um, so thanks again uh, so much uh, for your talk and uh, answering all these questions. It's been very, very cool. Um, I'm going to just grab back the screen share. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Hang on. Why isn't it working? Okay, there we go. All right, yeah, thanks again. That was um, a very fun talk. I always really like uh, weird uh, sort of Cambrian Burgess Shale uh, things. Um, so yes, thank, uh, again, thank you to Joe and thank you for all of us, or for all of you, to all of you for joining us. Um, again, we'll put in that uh, feedback form if you want to fill that out uh, to give us a bit of an idea about who's attended today's seminar. Um, and join us on uh, next week uh, to hear Evan Ramos from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, talk about swift and sustained silicate weathering response in floodplains during the PETM insights from the Bighorn Basin, uh, Wyoming, USA. Uh, so um, before then, what we've got coming up next um, is again, Joe's agreed to stick around uh, for a tea time and talk with us some more about um, all his weird arthropods. Um, and so please uh, join us um, to chat with him a bit more um, about arthropods or research or anything that you feel like talking about um, and you know make some new friends uh, chat with other people maybe you haven't seen in a while um, and yeah just generally um, have a quick chat before uh, getting back to whatever else you have to do today um, so we uh, before we get there we'll have a quick two minute break so you can uh, go grab uh, your tea or water or whatever you want um, and just stretch your legs. Um, but in two minutes, we'll be back for tea time. Um, so again, thanks so much, Joe. This has been um, a really interesting talk and look forward to chatting with you a bit more. Sounds good. See you at tea.